Now let's approach, use the approach for today's dilemma facing our people. The constant problem, the constant lament of lately is our what? Now two. One is the lack of lace in science and technology, and the other one is the lack of lace in business. And how do you approach the two? Let me take the second problem, lack of lace in business. Okay, let's take the problem of lack of lace in science. When I was in Form 6 in 19, early 6, and when I was in Form 5 in the 1950s, in my science class about 35, there were about 22 Malays in Portugal. That reflects roughly what the population of Malays versus non Malays. Of the 22 people in my, of the 22, of the 32 Malays in my class, two of us got into Form 6. And two went up, and two went on smoothly to the university. I'm one of two. Six of my other classmates did not get into sixth form. But they went to technical college, agricultural college. One of them was rich enough, the father sent to Australia. The result of that, all six get to the university eventually. One got a graduate degree from Cornell, another one got a PhD from, uh, from Australia. So in other words, if they had been formed enough form six spaces at that time, instead of just taking two, we could have taken another six more Malays, making a total of eight. In addition to that, among my, when I compare my classmates in Form 5 compared to my students in the university in Canada, another six of my classmates could have handled the university work I did in, in, in the University of Alberta. Which means to say that if we had enough six form slots at that time, we built six form places, not just two Malays that were in the six form, about 14 Malays, a 700% increase in Malay science and economics. This was at a time when all the Malay leaders say that Malays could not handle science. The reason they couldn't handle science is that we don't have enough opportunities. So how do we approach the problem then? Instead of building the more sixth form classes in which more opportunities Malays pursue science, the government built a university, the University of Kibasa, by 1970, they built the University of Assam, and, the book. and they graduated the first science class from the University of Assam in 1973. Guess how many science graduates they graduated? 39. Guess how many Malays they have there? 18. At a cost of three or four hundred million dollars, at that time, big money, they produced 18 Malay science graduates. If they just built a million dollars, a fraction of that cost, Six form, they could have got 14 million more potential science graduates. Because at that time we focus on the top end, but we don't focus on the middle end. The same thing is with uh, Malays in business. You all say you want Malays in business, but where do you put the focus on in Malays in business? Not the big middle for Salma to have a, for, for Salma to have a hair saloon or General Reed judges to start his own company. General Reed, fifty thousand dollars, you couldn't get a loan. You have to back around, wine and dine people to get fifty thousand dollars. But the government spent billions on pernas, 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 and all that stuff. <laughs> you know? And all that went back up. So in the long run, the most enduring way is to be the post minutes. So my suggestion to you is that. It's good to be thinking of pride and that sort of thing, but what you want to do, approach the problem that gives you the best results. During my time, the middle average is the need for primary and secondary schools. But thank God, because that program is successful, now the, sh the curve has shifted to the left. Now our average is no longer primary school, because everybody in Malaysia can go to primary school. Our average now is goes to more graduate studies and that sort of thing. So we can keep, we keep, we can keep to improve on that. So that's basically what, what all I have to say today. Thank you very much. I'll uh, have to take questions. Okay. Any questions? How do you look, how do you see the uh, problem of uh, dropouts 
what's the uh, solution to that? Uh, actually, I didn't put it in my slides. Uh, I don't think it's good. Why do people drop out of school? If you ask them the question, why do you quit school? What do you think most of the answers would be? And the typical answer is, I don't like school. I'm not learning anything. And the reason they're not learning anything, they don't like science, because we're not teaching them well. When I was in, in curricular science, all my teachers were foreigners. But they were interested in teaching us. We were actually doing science. We were analyzing, analyzing the pH, the water, and the river in my village. Every week, trying to see the variation of pH of uh, the season. Now, we were doing experiments. We were breaking test tubes when I was going to school. It's exciting. You're doing things. You're measuring things. We measure the rainfall every day to get a breakage. But in Malaysian high, in Malaysian high school, even in particular Sina, we don't do the experiments. The experiments are demonstrated to you. That's no fun. Science is like sex. Watching is no fun. You have to do it. So, <laughs> that's a good example. <laughs> So if you can, if you can air condition our laboratories, air condition our libraries, our kids are more likely to stay in school. The, like, the reason they like to in the mall is because the place is air conditioned, right? So if they have to air condition our school, they're more likely to stay there. Any other questions? Yeah, we have to stay there. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, so based on your distribution, graph just now. Uh, you say that we have to put 20% on the overachievers and 10% to underachievers. So wh why do you put 20% like 10% more compared to the underachievers? Why not just this put the same? Well, fairness is in the eyes of the beholder. The, the top 10% of the people, those are a future seed. If you are a farmer, what do you choose? You get the best seeds. You get the specialty. Because that will lead our nation to the top. So therefore, we must treat them well. So that's one reason, because they have a done. Not only that, if we treat them well, they do well, they will inspire the others. So the others who think they're good, or who have talent that they don't want to develop before, when they see the success rates, they will be inspired to do that. And when they're inspired, they act, those people act as a locomotive and try to shift the curve to the, to the right. That's the main reason. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just now, in the beginning of the slide, you talk about the uh, developed country and about the lower spend of the local. And do you think that we can achieve the goal, the, the nine challenge, uh, and the like, all the challenge like the uh, GDP of nine hundred million? 70 million people and all that in like 2020, just like the Wawa Science stated. It can be done. It can be done. You don't develop a country. That's the first mistake you make. You don't develop a country. You develop your people. And the amazing big thing about developing your people is that the potential for human development is limitless. I like, it, I like to tell a story of my friend, a guy, an Ivan guy from Srao, who went to school together. His father is literally a headhunter in his house, he's a headhunter. Now he's, he's a, uh, a corneal transplant surgeon in Canada, a very famous corneal transplant. I like to tease him. Your father has cut the head, you just cut the eyes. <laughs> the remarkable thing that that all happens within one generation. And that's the remarkable thing of human development. And if you provide schools in the villages, you provide laboratories in, in, in the villages today, you never know which one of those little kids in the village will become a star. We don't know. So it's just a matter of a few years, 10 years. And, and if one of them becomes a star, and you develop them, then the country will be transformed very quickly. The question is, can you develop it? Yes, definitely. Build school. I'm uh, sending you out here. That, that's the way you develop people. In fact, if it costs you a million to develop here, it, and it costs you 10,000 to, to, to develop you in Malaysia, why not develop you in Malaysia? 
being the university in Malaysia, more people can benefit from you. So you can't be done. You can't be done. But we must focus on a curve, the middle of the curve, uh, to, to get more student back. Yeah, no, nothing can happen. Singapore got developed within, when I left Johor Bahru in 1976, Singapore was on par with Malaysia in almost everything. In education development, the medical schools were the same, because I was teaching some of the medical students there. Within, within 10, 15 years, Singapore has been a very good thing. Because they focus on education and develop the people. You don't develop country, you develop the people. And then the country will follow suit. 